Hello everyone, good afternoon, and welcome to Savvy Central Radio. Each week, we host new individuals and business owners to share their expertise, dreams, and lessons learned in their field of business. Our guest today is Sean Dupern. Sean is a six-time Emmy Award-winning producer, PBS host, networking guru, and media expert. A PhD candidate in interpersonal communication, her expertise is gossip, how it impacts culture, the workplace, media, and our personal lives. Sean also teaches how our distorted view of media can get in the way of thoughtful, compelling reporting that move people in positive action. A veteran TV reporter and news producer, she blows away misconceptions about reporters, newsrooms, and gossip, which she calls the cultural glue that holds us together. Hi, Sean. Thanks for coming on Savvy Central today. How are you? You know, I'm doing pretty darn awesome. Thanks for having me, Christina. I am so excited to have you on Savvy today. I had heard your interview with Deb Deborah Scott on uh, Blog Talk Radio, and at first listen, I was a little bit thrown off when I heard you mention, you know, gossip and how gossip can be a good thing, and and I almost turned it off until I heard your description on it, and I thought I'd love to have you on and share about how gossip can be used for good in the world. Would you like to tell our audience a little bit about that? Sure. Well, let me just give you a, ma- a main premise. I really believe that new perceptions alter our destinies. When we see something with fresh eyes or a new way, we can really start see- seeing things differently. And I have been studying gossip, gosh, for the past seven years. I'm in the throes of my PhD prospectus right now uh, in the topic of gossip. So it actually is an academic study. And the bottom line is we think when we think gossip, we think mean and nasty, right? That's what we mm-hmm. think. Yeah. Well, the research shows that mean, nasty stuff is only about 5 to 7%. We're actually really, really, really good people. And it says a lot about where a word comes from. The word gossip comes from the word God sib, meaning close to God. Oh, wow. Like, no kidding. And what would happen is like in the 8th, ninth centuries, the doulas, the women delivering babies, would spread the precious news that a precious child of God was born and they were called God's sibs. There's many things that happened in between then and now that changed the connotation of the word. But bottom line for us, when you think about gossip, it's actually word of mouth. Like, go see that movie, it rocks. Oh my gosh, listen to Deb Scott's blog talk radio show. She's fantastic. Exactly. Yeah, and that's really the, the, the premise behind good gossip, which is, you know, a lot of what we're, that's coming out of our mouths. You know, it's very interesting, and I had read, I don't know if you got to read his wonderful books, uh, by Martin Lindstrom, Biology and Brand Washed, brand washed. Um, fabulous book. He is a brander and uh, marketer, and he had mentioned that when people are unhappy about a particular experience with a the company, they will talk a lot more when they have a negative experience than when it's a positive experience, and I wonder what that would be all about, because you think you would speak a lot more about something that was a positive experience. You know, the research is mixed on that, because a lot of researchers say the reason we think there's more negative gossip is because we remember it, because it violated a social norm. And gossip really explains the functionality of social norms. So gossip fits needs like entertainment, status building, um, lowering uncertainty. And we have a tendency to remember emotional things and negative things. So that's why it may give the appearance of a lot of negativity going around. Hmm. And I think that's why for a good portion of time I've really been turned off to listening to media shows on TV that, you know, kind of focus on the negative and talk about, you know, maybe negative things about people and situations that I just don't want that brought into my life. And I would really like to see your brand of gossip, you know, hit across all of media. Yeah, I love it. And, you know, to piggyback off that, I'm a media trainer by trade, okay? So I teach people how to work with the media. And actually, my ulterior motive is to transform the conversations that are virally spiraling out. Because here's what I found. Can I just put on my PhD hat? Go for for it. (laughs) Here's what I found is that research, you know, when when I was a reporter and people would call up with these amazing stories, they'd never make it on the air for many reasons. 
One is they call up with their amazing story making a difference and within four seconds I could tell they'd never make it on the air because if you're kind of strange on the phone, if you're scared or your voice is shaken or you're not certain, I sure as heck can't put you on camera. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. So it really doesn't have anything in that moment to do with the 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 balance or the positive or negative aspects of the story. So that's one component. The other piece looks at this notion of research and there's a, a theory called agenda setting theory. Some of you may have heard of it or not. It was coined by a guy named Walter Lippmann back in the 20s and he basically says that the media sets the agenda. And I'm like, yeah, I get that as a student. I was a master's student at the time, but I'm working in a newsroom. You know, I worked at ABC, NBC, and that's not what's happening in the newsroom, mm -hmm. okay? Um, what's happening is we're covering stories very differently than research shows. And then I found another theory called agenda setting theory, and that's when it kerplunked for me and actually had me go on to get a PhD. Because hmm. basically what that theory says is that 90% of what makes it on the air is pitched to the news media. Hmm. And another way to say that is news is passive. Passive. Yeah, news is passive and people don't know that because we're in the newsroom. Of course, there's natural stories we're going to cover. We're going to cover politics. We're going to cover leaders, blah, blah, blah. And we also are committed to showcasing what's going on in the community. So in the newsroom, newsroom we're relying on people to give us information, press releases, and those types of things so we can showcase what's going on into the community. And there's a very small select few who are actually making up 90% of what makes it on the air. So the reason I became a media trainer is to bridge that gap, to show people really how easy it is to pitch the media, how to lower fear. So, Because as soon as you know how to do this, it's freaking easy. It is. <laughs> Once you, it is. When you break through your own fear and start having your own voice, that's when miracles start to manifest. That's when we're going to start to see the stories we really want to see. And that's when the virility and the application of gossip is going to cause a spillover in positive talk. That's the game I'm playing. Wow. So tell me, what do you think the fear comes from for, for a great many people who are, you know, when they call the media and they have this fear based behind them? Is it because it feels too big to them, like they're talking to a celebrity? What, what do you think it is? Oh, gosh, it's so based in biology. It's about stereotypes. Everything comes down to stereotypes. And we put things in labels, um, good and bad. Um, you know, like we do it with lawyers. We have a stereotype that all lawyers, you know, not all, but you get what I'm saying, that lawyers, be careful of lawyers. We have the same thing with car salesmen. We have the same thing with the media. They're, they're just looking to put negative stuff out or they're just, they're, they'll misconstrue when actually the people they're relying on, because they rely on sources, media relies on sources. Mm -hmm. The people, the sources that we are, they are relying are relying on are the ones that are giving them inaccurate information. So if you're a financial planner, for instance, and you see a story on the air from your local TV, and the financial planner, and it's the wrong advice, and you're sitting there going, that is just crap. Mm -hmm. That's just wrong. My game is to have you move through the fear so you'll call up the newsroom not make them wrong for putting up the wrong information, saying, hey, I saw that financial planner on there and he gave this perspective. You know, there's another way to look at this and I have this to offer and to create another way to share the stories. Because what's going on in newsrooms is they have a basket of fruit and most of the fruit in that basket is apples. And so they keep going to that basket to get their stories. People like you and I need to throw in some oranges and some mangoes and some freaking watermelon for goodness sakes so the media have a different type of fruit to talk about in cultural discourse and cultural conversations so my game is to educate to alleviate some of that fear because when, once you're educated about it increase knowledge lower fear baby increase knowledge lower fear and my game is to keep increasing your knowledge so that your fear level goes extremely low and you can bust through this stuff because we busted through it in social media. That's what's so cool that really validates what I'm saying. Because we say things in social media that we would not say to the ABC station. You follow me? Oh, yes. Most definitely. Yeah. And what's so cool is the ABC station is savvy enough to pick up on what's going on in social media to get some real voices of what's being said. That's what's so exciting to me about social media. Because we've had the power all along. We're like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Click your heels. We're home. We got it. It's just breaking through those barriers of stereotypes to be able to pitch our story to the media.
that's really the bottom line for me. Wow. And this just completely transforms my perspective on media that I've had all these years, that media, just as you were saying, is dulling out a whole bunch of negative stuff. Why are they doing it? And putting all the blame on them without realizing that they were just taking in the sources that they were getting, which a good portion of it was just apples, as you said, and maybe negative stuff coming in, but nothing to counter it. Yes, exactly. And the bottom line for me about this mm -hmm. is that every time we diss the media, and this isn't a very high vibrational, if that's an okay word to use, a very high vibrational or high spiritual conversation, although that's not the right word, that the bottom line is there really is no media. It's a cause and effect. The conversations that are being created in media are coming from us whether we participate or not. Mm. And my game is to show you how to participate so we can actually cause a shift in how we listen to our news and think about it. Oh, because oh. all right. So here's something. But here's a way to think about it. Our newscasts are very similar to how we talk. Okay. We've been talking a lot longer than than a, a TV newscast has been created okay so think about it for a second you know in a newscast you say don 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 five people are dead six people are dead six people are dead and then the the anchor next to her and yeah and uh none has died and there was a bus crash with pregnant young girls and all this tragedy and then all of a sudden they go to the lead story and they go on and on and on about the lead story mm -hmm. they will take us to the hospital they'll take us to the cop shop they'll take us to the ceo who's in charge of the problem Problem. And then throughout the newscast, there will be sprinkled in some sports conversation. There will be sprinkled in some weather several times throughout the newscast. Once in a while, a miracle will show up, but that's really the essence of a newscast, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about how we verbally talk, mm -hmm. how many times have you sat in a meeting and everybody's got to get their word in and you're just thinking they're going, shoot me in the head, shut up. Everybody, it's like the same conversation over and over and over from all these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So from different locations on a newscast, okay, from the same story. Maybe you're talking to someone at the water cooler and someone bursts up and breaks up your conversation. That's breaking news. That's how breaking news goes, right? Yeah. How many times are you in the, in the bank, at the bank lineup and you start talking about the weather? Because it's a very safe intimate conversation and applying it to gossip research men have a tendency to men and women by the way gossip the same amounts research shows wow. it hand, hand 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 we just gossip about different things and men have a tendency to talk about leaders and sports figures women have a tendency to talk about home life because they're we're nesting and nurturing our homes it's not straightforward that's just tendencies so sports is a good section to have in the newscast because that's a, a, a pertinent conversation for men. So even just saying this out loud, you can hear the, the segmentation of newscasts and how it mirrors how we culturally talk. And, in, and I assert until we change our cultural conversations, our news will never, ever, ever, ever change. Wow. And you know what is really coming to the surface for me is that I've been feeling over a number of years that there's this kind of entertainment element of it that, you know, as you just said, oh, baby just died and then there was this car crash and it's like excitable, fun entertainment and, and people have gotten great joy out of hearing all this negative stuff. And as you mentioned, the same thing happens at the water cooler as you talk about what Cindy just did. Oh, did you hear she broke up and, and blah, blah, blah. So it seems to me that news has been kind of used by our society, not by just the media, but all of us as a society as a whole has been using media as a means to entertain ourselves. Yeah. And there's, 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 it's, that's actually one of the functions of gossip is it entertains us. So in a broader category, news really is gossip. It's this guy killed somebody in a car crash. Mm -hmm. Um, this celebrity has done such and such. And there's many functions of gossip overarching. And one of them is to set social norms. And when someone violates a social norm, we talk about it to get it back in order and culture. Let me give you an example. Is, is this the kind of conversation you want to have? Because well, I've done this for days, honey. Okay. <laughs> so, because my dissertation, all my stuff is around celebrity gossip. So, do you remember when Britney Spears? This, I don't know, maybe this was eight or nine years ago, maybe eight, well, maybe seven years ago, when she was driving on the freeway with her baby on her lap. Do you remember that? No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. This was a significant story, okay? There's in all the tabloids and all the, you know, all the shows and all the news, the, the, 
The comedians had a field day with it. She was literally driving with her baby on her lap. Okay. So a couple of things going on with that. First of all, there's outrage because, oh my gosh, what a bad mother. Look what she did. Okay. And the nature of news is to repeat the story and to create different types of stories to go with that news. So you would see what else might mothers want to consider when they're driving with their kids. Maybe you should, then you'd see a story about showing parents how to properly install car seats. Are you with me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Because she violated a social norm and now we need to make it right. And in discourse, her doing that probably actually saved millions of lives because she reinforced the value of driving with kids in car seats. And Rihanna did the same thing with, um, and she's doing it right now with this whole notion of domestic violence. She's brought the, she's done many things and I'm not condoning mm -hmm. violence in any way. And I do feel sad for Rihanna for what she's had to go through. Okay. Like with that said, mm -hmm. and the biggest contribution that this conference, that this situation has created as 10, 11, and 12 inner city girls are talking about and learning what domestic violence actually is because many of them are not even exposed to that conversation. So the discourse, because of a norm was violated when Chris Brown hit her, the globalness of the conversation is setting the norm to place and it evolves. So we naturally, as a culture, want to say what's okay and what's not okay. What's not okay. And Tiger Woods did the same thing when he violated social norms, not by having sex with one woman, but with dozens and dozens and dozens. So we're constantly recreating these social norms. So it's, in an essence, it's keeping us all in check with our mor morality and such. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So tell me, yeah. when you started this and you went for your PhD and everything on this subject, what propelled you to want to really research the, the topic of gossip? Um, it, you know, it comes back to watching things go viral. Because even in my business, as my business grew, I knew there was something interesting going on in how I interacted with people when I networked. Um, having a buzz around me and what I'm doing. I knew buzz had a lot to do with it. The other piece, too, is significantly is this whole notion of forgiveness. And I know you know I'm doing this project, Project Forgive. Yes. And forgiveness is probably the basic theme of everything I do. Forgiving the media for not being perfect and giving them, putting some more watermelons and apples in their apple basket, okay? Because um, for doing... Uh, broader cultural forgivenesses of bureaucracies is very, very difficult. And when you go on the media and you're interviewed and you don't do it 100%, can you forgive yourself for not being at 100% so then you can move back to the place where miracles manifest and play and dance in that realm? And I saw this connection with forgiveness in the middle. And then also significantly, I had a dear friend lose his family to a drunk driver that was the catalyst for this film and movement that we created. Mm. And, um, and the irony was that Gary, is it okay if I just talk about this? Go for it, yes. Yeah. Gary, um, dear friend of ours, his wife Judy was my husband's business coach and his two sons, Sammy and Alex, my children babysat those kids. And we got a call that Gary's family was annihilated by a drunk driver, okay? Mm. It was, it was a really significant day, and it became more significant when a couple hours later I got a call that the man who killed them is also another dear family friend. Wow. Yeah, and, and just that, I don't want to say coincidence, that's not the word I want. That situation that I'm in exquisitely put me in a position to create something, and it comes from this ability to be able to hold two different dichotomous ideas, like Tom's a, a bad man, he killed three people, and Tom's a good man who's made a difference in the community and is a good person who made a horrible mistake. To be able to hold those two very different ideas in your brain at once is, to me, the epitome of what forgiveness is. And it became apparent to me that I need to go on this journey of creating a film because, you know, I spend a lot of time speaking and training. I, that's the bulk of what I do. And I always pick and choose projects as I go along the way. And Project Forgive became a big project of mine. Hmm. So tell me, what is the project, you know, what is your, what are you trying to accomplish with Project Forgive? Yeah, it's a nonpartisan, non-religious movie. The whole premise is, is an inquiry of what exactly is forgiveness? What is it? For some people, it's forgive and forget. For some people, it's this elaborate process. For the Amish people, look how they forgave quickly when that shooting happened. 
what exactly is this notion of forgiveness? So we're going around interviewing a bunch of people with horrific stories that like almost forgiving the unforgivable to dealing with scientists with, that look at our heart rates and how they lower when we're dealing with road rage. Like, like say somebody cuts you off on the freeway and it takes you 15 minutes to calm down from that because they're so angry they did that. Mm -hmm. Like all these different situations that we face. And what we did, you know, like in this past year is we did a Kickstarter campaign. Have you heard of the Kickstarter stuff? Yes, I have indeed. Yeah. We raised $100,000 pretty quickly in about three weeks for the seed money for the movie. We're making a real Hollywood movie. Wow. And, uh, we continue to raise funds for it to finish the, the filming. We're about, I would say, a good third of the way done in the in the filming. And, um, and we just keep moving along, doing fundraisers and just watching it evolve and unfold. It is an amazing, amazing thing, forgiveness. Uh, many years ago, I, I came from an abusive um family household and for yeah. years I held on to this deep unforgiveness and anger and it really just eats up at you and in, in your insides by you know and just destroys your life yes that's that's so significant and Christina this is probably why I liked you so much because I've been seeing you on social media and you just resonated with me I could tell you had a lot of depth to you you know that you would mm -hmm. that you that you and your show would have depth that would really cause and make a difference. So it's I deeply resonate with you. Oh, me do. too. I, I loved your interview, and you really changed my perspective on gossip, media, and, and even forgiveness. And I'm really grateful that you came on to speak to everyone because this is a very important message. I mean, a lot of people gripe and complain about what they're seeing or hearing in the media. and But like you said, everyone can step up and make a difference. And it's nice to know that you're out here to help people be the ones to help change what's going on instead of being passively sitting back waiting for the next person to do it yeah and, the, and that whole premise is having those fresh eyes that new perspective whether it's a new perspective on what gossip is a new perspective on what media is and even a new perspective of what forgiveness means for you because it's different for everybody mm -hmm. and it is an ever never-ending journey I find I mean just when I think I've completed a forgiveness on a particular topic or person something will come up and I'm like where is that from and I realize it's from something I'm still carrying around and mm -hmm. it's that constant evolution of working through forgiveness because as you said none of us are perfect not the media not any of us and it's you know and I think the ones that we un how should you say not forgive the most are ourselves we're the harshest yeah. on ourselves Absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, is it okay if I like yeah. dive into like um, a little bit deeper conversation? Oh, yes. Because um, I want to talk about um, child molestation. Just take a breath, okay? And I, I feel like I have permission to talk about it. You do. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I was molested as a child. So that's why I'm deeply resonating with you, Christina, when we grew up in some kind of a abusive situation. And people always ask me, you know, here I am, I'm almost 50 years old. And I can honestly say it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it, it moves me to say that because at this deeper, beautiful level, mm. it's not about saying that incest or child molestation is okay. That's not even it. It's the journey that I have gone through to become the person that I am today who is one of the most compassionate, exquisite people I know. That's what I say about me. And when I can be in that place of being for myself, I have it for everybody. And as you say this layering that you're going through, you know, like, because that's common, mm. what I like to do is I like to reframe a definition of forgiveness. Because you know, I'm going through some stuff right now, and I can honestly say I've forgiven the man who molested me. I can honestly say that. Does that mean on Tuesday I just didn't think of him and think, oh, gosh, I'm so angry about this because of this situation today? No, that happens all the time. Mm. Forgiveness is more about acceptance of what's so and having a peacefulness around it. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about. It's it's even and sometimes it's an ex, and it's an acceptance of an apology that you never received. And it doesn't mean different feelings don't pop up and different feelings might be anger, resentment, a giggle. Those are just feelings. And it and the bottom line for forgiveness, it's not a definitive act. Forgiveness is a way of being.
period. Mm, that is so deep and true because for me, when um, me and my father in particular many years ago, I decided I was holding on to this deep anger and I had to have it out with him. But I knew he would just hang up the phone if I just called him up and say, hey, this is what I'm angry about. So yeah. I, I made up a cassette tape at the time. And the first cassette tape, I cursed my brains out and like screamed and hollered. And I thought, okay, I can't send this because he just won't listen to it. The next yeah. one I did in third person. And I said, well, he's not going to relate to it because I'm not in it. So then I did it again. And by the third taping, I was super calm and peaceful and just said the facts. Here's why I'm angry. Here's why I have unforgiveness. And I want to work towards forgiving you. And I sent it to him and he was very hurt by it. But it opened up the door to a conversation for the both of us. And, and like you said, it's not always possible that people can have this conversation. But for me, that was just my process. And yeah. and now there are times where I've accepted what happened, but there's anger that comes up around incest and, and child mis- molestation and other such things yeah. that I get angry. And, you know, I think, well, does that mean I don't forgive him? And you know what? As you mentioned, anger doesn't have to be a bad thing. It could com- propel you to take action to help make life better. Just acknowledge the emotion and go forward and not judge it. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. You know, and when we did this, we did this little five minute video that went viral. That's probably one of the main reasons we raised that initial hundred thousand dollars. And in that, in that video, we interviewed kids, four year olds Mm -hmm. asking about forgiveness. And actually it's just so pure and beautiful because children are so pure and simple. Mm -hmm. And, um, And I also asked them other questions. I asked them about anger. Mm -hmm. 24 four-year-olds unanimously said anger was bad. Really? Yes. And it's interesting. Like, parents aren't doing a bad job. where They're not saying, don't be angry. That's bad to be angry. We're not doing it. Subliminally, though, we're saying, we're being anger is not okay. And that's a disconnect in our culture. It's a disconnect in our culture. And maybe it's more about validating children when they're angry because we have so much discomfort in our own bodies around anger yeah. that we squash it because we don't know how to validate anger. Yeah, I agree. It, it's something that can be used as a tool. It doesn't have to be bad or good. No emotion has to be bad or good. Just the expressing of it and letting it go. And and that's hard for me because I know I think, oh, I want to be a nice person. I can't be angry at this person. But to even if they're not in the room, to fully acknowledge the anger or the feeling, the emotion, and let it move through me and go forward. Exactly. exactly. And if, to think about it like in another way for a new perspective, mm-hmm. okay, all right, I'm, I think this, I'm sitting at my computer and I'm watching a video on Facebook and I laugh out loud. Would I say to myself, oh, Sean, quit laughing. Why did you laugh? Versus I uh, my husband did something and I'm really angry and then I go inside and say, oh gosh, you got to forgive him, Sean. Why are you even feeling angry? Just look at the difference in those conversations when anger and a giggle or a laugh or a feeling of anger, they're very similar. They're just feelings and all the heavy connotations we have towards this emotion of anger. It's just very interesting, isn't it? It is. It is. It's very interesting how we've taken emotions and made them good or bad or you know, mm-hmm. evil or negative. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And because, you know, anger can be used as a tool, as I just mentioned, if you have a great anger towards abuse, you can work to help change it, you know, help there be laws to, you know, that, you know, can help abused wives or such. But if you just sit in the anger, not express it, not allow it to, you know, be expressed, it'll end up probably in disease or, you know, wrecking your body or your health or, you know, whatever, whatnot. Absolutely. Sex addiction, um, overeating, depression, all of that. All of that happens. Absolutely. And think about mothers against drunk driving. Thank God they got so angry. Yes. They caused a global transformation in drinking and driving from their anger. Woohoo. Yay. Tell me about it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I am so grateful you came on to Savvy today to share your perspective. I'm hoping it will open the eyes of everyone out there. And how might they get in contact with you if they'd like to reach out and find out more about getting their message out to the media? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, best way to connect with me is Sean TV, S-H-A-W-N-E-T-V dot com. Also on Facebook, just throw my name in there, Sean TV, you'll find me. 
Um, also, just want to flag Project Forgive, www.projectforgive.com. If you want to share your story, get involved in some way, or feel inspired to pledge, go for it, baby. And also, we're on Facebook. We're rocking it out on Facebook. It's pretty miraculous what's going on. Yes, you are. Thank you so much, Sean, for coming on Savvy Central. And is there any last words of advice you'd like to leave our listeners with? You know what? My, you know what my advice would be, Christina? Hmm. To listen to your show. Oh, I love that advice. <laughs> There's, you know, there's something about you that just jumps out at the computer when I tap on your name or I see you in LinkedIn. Um, you know, I'm getting, I'm at a cool place. I'm getting lots of requests to do interviews, and I'm just really listening to my guidance about where I'm supposed to go and all that. I was quite clear, just from your energy, that this was the perfect place to grow and learn and create that atmosphere. You foster it. So my advice is to listen to your show. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for yeah, coming on Savvy Central Radio. My absolute pleasure. Mwah. Ah, thank you. Join us this Monday, April 22nd, where our guest will be Jacob Nordby, author of The Divine Arsonist.